Uh, thank you very much. So, um, thanks, Simon, for the introduction. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a radiologist. So, you know, what, what would I know about diet? I'm, I'm a I, radiologist. Are doctors? Um, so, you know, I had uh, I had an excellent education in nutrition. I had my one lecture during six years of medical schools, like all <laughs> other doctors do. So, obviously, I'd know what I'm talking about. It's really been since then that I've uh, that I've learnt about nutrition and developed a real interest in nutrition. I always had an interest in it, but have obviously through personal circumstance, have developed more of an interest recently. So I thought I'd start out by telling my story about what happened to me, and just a little sort of short history, and then talk about um, what I did and, and, and the changes it made. And then, and then I thought I'd talk on a little bit more of a broader topic, because if it works for me, then perhaps there's some other people who would, who would benefit from, from my lifestyle. It's not really a diet, it's a lifestyle. Um, so, at uh, 41 years of age, in October 2012, I diagnosed myself with, with type 1 diabetes. I had had a period of recent weight loss, been waking up at night to urinate, I'd been getting tired and sort of a bit grumpy, all classical signs of type 1 diabetes, and I woke up one morning and thought, oh, it couldn't be diabetes, could it, and um, dipped my own urine and I had ketones and glucose and, and diagnosed myself. So I followed, I went off to the clinic and I was given the standard dietary advice that you would get at the clinic. The picture of the food pyramid was up on the wall. I um, saw my endocrinologist, I went off to see the dietitian um, and, and uh, she, she, this was the advice I was given. So 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate for each of three meals, to snack a couple of times on 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrate. That adds up to a total carbohydrate load of 240 grams per day. I was told, told that the brain needed 130 grams of glucose a day um, to function. I was also told that the brain could only function on glucose. Both of those statements are in incorrect. Um, and type 1 diabetics, you have to bolus insulin to cover the carbohydrates. If you go to the Diabetes Australia website, I mean, the clinic I went to is essentially following their exact guidelines, which are that you should base your diet on carbohydrate foods, um, such as whole grain breads and cereals, and it should be low in fat, particularly saturated fat. Now, I was going to be, so this is essentially what the advice sort of amounts to, just so people understand. You sort of figure out how many carbohydrates you're going to have in a meal, um, and then using that, you sort of use a mathematical sort of formula to sort of figure out what sort of insulin you should dose with. It sort of looks a little bit like this. You know, you have your cornflakes and low-fat milk and dose yourself with some insulin to, to cover that glucose load. If we look at the three different types of macronutrients and um, their effect on glucose, you see that carbohydrate shoots it up quite high. Protein sort of will raise it you know, a little, a little bit, and fat doesn't raise it at all. And really, if you think about it, and you were to sort of reverse engineer the perfect diet for a diabetic, you'd, you'd probably say, well, gee, carbohydrate's going to shoot my glucose up, so I don't want to have any of that unless there's something essential in it. And there's nothing really essential in carbohydrates, except there are some phytonutrients and micronutrients that you get from green leafy vegetables, which are actually very low in carbohydrates. So, we might say, well, we'll include those because they're low in carbohydrates, so I'm going to get some essential nutrients. Protein, is, again, is essential, so we want some of that. Now, it does raise our glucose a little bit. So, you know, you, you want an adequate amount of protein, and that's what I have. I don't have a high protein, I have just adequate. And fat doesn't raise our glucose at all, and, and it's essential, and it's an excellent source of energy. So you'd end up coming up with a very low carbohydrate, adequate protein, high fat diet and that's what I follow. If you follow the standard advice you end up on the roller coaster and I did and so this is two months into following standard advice I was very strict and this is my blood glucose you can see it shooting up all over the place um, I was having a hypo a week that's where you go low and you feel sort of you know it feels like you're sort of almost drunk or you see stars and that sort of stuff and you need to have some carbohydrates to fix it now, this is actually considered pretty good control, by the way. I, I would have ended up with a HbA1c probably under 7, just based on these glucose. To give you some idea, 7% of type 1 diabetics in the UK can get a HbA1c under 7. So I would have been in the good group. I'd have gone to clinic, and the clinic would have been pretty... In fact, they were happy, and they would have been pretty happy with this. I wasn't happy. 
because I was worried about the long-term complications. And I was having a high bar week. So two months after getting the standard advice, I changed my diet, to, or my lifestyle really, to a low-carb, high-fat lifestyle. I was able to cease my, my bolus insulin. Now, if you've had type 1 diabetes for a while, I would, I'm still sort of in the honeymoon phase, which is early and on the, past the diagnosis of diabetes, so I would still probably be producing some insulin, and I'm currently able to get away with not bolusing. But as the condition progresses and I lose more islet cells, I probably will have to bolus a little bit for the protein, but currently I'm getting away with, without, so happy days for me. Um, so I, see, I was able to cease my bol bolus insulin, which is the every meal insulin, and I just take the basal insulin. A type 1 diabetic must continue taking their insulin or they can run into diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a fatal condition. So I'm not... This, whilst a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet will lower your insulin requirements, it doesn't take them away. So I changed my lifestyle to essentially this food pyramid and these sorts of foods. And this was the result. So this is now February 2014. So this is um, 16 months post-diagnosis. My insulin dose is now eight units. And I, as I say, I might have to increase it in the future. I might have to have small bolses, but it will always be less than it was before. My mean glucose is now 5.4. Um, I don't. I very rarely spike over 7.5, and my HbA1c, that's a measure of your average glucose over the preceding 120 days, is 5.2. That is normal range. So normal range is less than 5.5. So essentially, based on these sort of measurements, I, my risk factors are probably around about the same as the healthy community. There's a lot of people in the community who'd be running higher HbA1cs than me, and yet they've got a pancreas that actually secretes insulin. So based on this, if the advice to me was wrong, and I think it was wrong, I'm 100% convinced that the advice that I received was wrong, then maybe the advice of a lot more of the community is also wrong. And that's what I believe. This was my uh, visit to the endocrinologist. Um, as I said, HbA and C5.2, rarely going over 7.5. That's important, by the way. Those spikes... Um, when you get a spike of glucose after a meal, that damages your endothelium. That's what sets you up for long-term vascular damage, which is the main problem that diabetics suffer from. Um, my last hypoglycemic episode was six months ago. Um, I was having one a week. My triglycerides are down. My HDL's up. My waist circumference is good. My blood pressure's good. My weight's good. And I'm back doing all the sort of exercise I enjoyed before. I really feel like I've got my life back. And, you know, people ask me why I... Why I prepared to speak about this, there was a, an interview I listened to by Dr Richard Bernstein, who whose book was incredibly influential on me, and uh, he said that when he figured this out, um, and he was one of the first person to figure this out, and he wrote, he's written some books on it, he, he said he felt he'd been released from prison, and that's really what I felt like. I felt like I'd been released from prison, but, you know, what, what do you do for the other people who are stuck in prison? And, uh, and that's why I'm prepared to speak about it, because... Again, it's very confronting for, people, for doctors to speak against the mainstream and, and I, I really applaud the courage of, of a lot of the people who are speaking today. This was a small trial done out of Sweden um, by Jorgen um, Vesti Nielsen, so just a bit of science, and he, he, he basically showed similar results to what I've experienced. These patients weren't um, honeymooning diabetics, by the way. They were established type 1 diabetics. Th these are fantastic results. If you had a drug that did this, you, it, would, it would be every doctor would prescribe it. <laughs> and I think, I think that's one of the other things I'll say about, you know, to, if I was to criticise the medical profession, it's that we're very good at medications, but the problem is, is that when the only tool you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and, and we're not very good at nutrition, and we don't think about the cause and effect a lot. So going on now, that's my personal story. That's why I think I've got some qualifications to, to talk about this. I've done a lot of reading. This is the problem that we face, the obesity and diabetes epidemic. Um, we've got fat kids. We've got fat dogs, <laughs> fat pets. They're also exposed to our Western diet. And we've, we've got fat ourselves. And we've got diabetes. And it's a looming disaster. And it'll bankrupt us if we don't fix it. Low-fat guidelines were introduced in 1970s. They haven't been very successful. In fact, we've seen things get worse. 
and yet we keep getting this message that it's the fat that's the problem when in fact it's the sugar. Professor of Nutrition and Epidemiology at Harvard said the overemphasis on reducing fat has caused the consumption of carbohydrates and sugar in our diets to, to soar. That's because the manufactured food industry has used this to their advantage. They've stamped everything with low fat. It's full of sugar and that shift is linked to our, to our health problems that we see today. We've already seen this graph today of sugar consumption versus the obesity and I'm a big believer that it's the fructose and the sucrose in our diet and the processed carbohydrates that are fueling this crisis. I want to just talk a little bit about, so we've talked about type 1 diabetes, what about type 2 diabetes? Well, 90% of cases of diabetes are actually type 2 and it's secondary to a combination of genetics and lifestyle and I think sugar is a big cause of that. It's essentially characterised by insulin resistance where blood glucose levels rise, that's what does the damage, but also insulin levels are high in a type 2 diabetic my belief is that they should be considered carbohydrate intolerant. Similarly, the other problem we see are not quite diabetic, but they also have a problem with insulin resistance, and this is the metabolic syndrome. So a lot of people who wouldn't, don't fit the category of type 2 diabetes, but they have metabolic syndrome. They have abdominal obesity, elevated triglycerides, low HDL, elevated blood pressure, and elevated fasting glucose. And if you've got three or more of these, then you're considered yet to have metabolic syndrome. And again, I would argue that these people should be regarded as carbohydrate intolerant. There was a question before about how do you know whether you're insulin resistant? And one of the things I read on the net and uh, go along with is that if you walk up to a wall and your belly touches it first, <laughs> you're insulin resistant. <laughs> Long-term complications of diabetes and also metabolic syndrome are related to the vascular damage that it causes. So the high glucose damages the endothelium, it sets up an inflammatory process in the wall of your endothelium and, and we go on to all of these complications. Um, increased cancer risk as well from the elevated um, insulin and dementia is also a risk and that's becoming more understood as well. So how do we solve this problem? Now, Einstein said we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them, and yet that seems to be all the advice we're given. You, you're, you're not doing it well enough. You're not doing the low-fat thing well enough. Well, I think, I think we've got it all wrong. I think we've got it back to front. So how, how should we prevent and manage these conditions? Well, what if cause and effect are reversed in, in terms of, at the moment, we've got this idea that you become overweight or well, at least a lot of the medical profession do, you become overweight and that means you've, you know, you, uh, you've got insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and therefore if we treat the weight, we can help the insulin resistance. And I'm going to argue, or well, my belief is that it's actually reversed. I believe that the insulin resistance comes first and that leads to obesity and then down the road to type 2 diabetes. So this is what I'm going to argue, that sugar and processed carbohydrates produce the insulin resistance, that the insulin resistance leads to these other problems. This is a slide by Volek. So people who read the low-carb sort of literature, Stephen, uh, uh, Jeff Volek, sorry, and Stephen Finney uh, are, um, uh, you know, have been researching this area for 20 or 30 years. I actually think this graph explains a lot of what's going on. And it, it argues that, you know, because I, I get asked the question, you know, well, should, you know, slim, fit people say, oh, should I be low-carb? Well, I think, again, that you can think about there's the metabolically well people and the, they're these people on this low blue line. So they're very insulin sensitive and they, they can actually tolerate quite a high carbohydrate load, particularly if it's not sugar and not processed foods. So they could, you know, have sweet potatoes and potatoes and those sorts of things and, they'll, and whole fruit and they'll be just fine. And that, and, and that is part of the problem because if you go along and you see a dietitian who's slim and insulin sensitive, they're going to say, hey, look, this is the diet that I eat and it works for me. So, you know, it should work for you. But, but it doesn't. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And so if you're metabolically damaged in some way, in other words, you have developed insulin resistance and have metabolic syndrome type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, that diet's not going to work for you, OK? And so you're on one of these curves, OK? There's moderate, markedly, severely or morbidly insulin resistant. By the way, you can change curve too if you continue your, you know, high-sugar diet. And that's the problem that these run into. So if you're morbid, if you have a, you know, severe insulin resistance, then 
to get back to a healthy weight and to sort of correct your metabolic disorders, then you have to carbohydrate restrict. And so it just depends on your level of insulin resistance, how much you should carbohydrate restrict. Again, another slide from one of Volek's talks, sort of just talking the difference between carbohydrate tolerant versus intolerant. And that all it's dependent on your insulin resistance and where you are on the spectrum. Sugar damp... Uh, no, this slide's to say... So I'm going to just explain that concept a little bit more about how insulin resistance could lead to obesity, metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. In our blood su supply at any time, we've only got about four to five teaspoons of sugar. Okay? If it goes higher than that, your body will secrete insulin to get it out of the blood supply. But when you become insulin resistant, so what happens, you eat carbohydrate foods, your pancreas secretes insulin to get that blood glucose down. And insulin signals an abundance of external energy. So fat is stored and the mobilisation of fat from stores is suppressed. Okay? So people talk about insulin being a key, and it is, it's a key for glucose to enter cells, but it's also a lock. It locks your fat stores. Okay? So if you have insulin resistance when you have a carbohydrate meal, you'll get a lot more sugar, which will stay higher for longer, and you'll secrete a lot more insulin and it'll hang around for longer. And Grant's shown some excellent slides on that. I'm using the sort of syringes to give you the concept of lots of insulin. And so, as I said though, because insulin's a key to get glucose into cells and to store fat, but it also locks up your fat stores. And so if you're running a high insulin all the time, you've got a one-way valve into your fat stores. You can push energy into them, but you can't get energy out. So you end up sort of like this soccer ball that you're pumping up all the time. You can, it's a one-way feed in into your fat cells. You're not able to mobilise them, and you're not very metabolically flexible. The healthy person will store a little bit of fat, and then when they're fasting, they can mobilise it to burn again. The metabolically unhealthy person, it's all one way. They can't mobilise it again. So what's the solution? Well, you need to switch your energy provider. <laughs> You've got to understand how the, how the mitochondria works. We can burn fat for energy. We don't have to burn sugar. And so we can drop our carbohydrate-rich foods. We can switch to low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. And that'll unlock our fat stores. It'll, it'll lower our insulin and it allows us to use that fat for energy. If you look at the aims or what they should be for diabetes metabolic syndrome, it's to normalise blood sugars, minimise our spikes, reduce blood pressure, improve our lipid profile and other biomarkers. And if you look at what a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet does, it does all of those things. It can sometimes elevate your LDL, which people get very worried about, but it changes the composition from the small, dense ones to the large, buoyant ones. We'll hopefully, we'll hear a bit more about that today. There's a study... And there's some references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.